A knowledge base is a place where, in the hunt for meaning, information is gathered and organized into what we call knowledge. As life itself, which would not have evolved without the organization of cells, the formation and management of knowledge is a dynamic process with no given roads or goals. We can set goals for ourselves and we shall find our own way to get there. This lesson is meant to provide some help with the goal of setting up your own personal knowledge base. In practice, this comes down to a mindful approach to note-taking. But before digging deeper into the how, let's be clear on the why. Why would anyone need a knowledge base? Is this even something for you? It's certainly not for everyone. A knowledge base is for you if you not only just like to consume and experience and listen, read and watch a lot, but you also like to take notes on things, to record memories, to do research and to create or study or simply write ambitious stuff. Maybe something like educational video scripts. I have a Skillshare class on writing these, it's free within the Skillshare trial and linked below. See you around! Now, for a better understanding of what a knowledge base is all about, we gotta go back to school. History 101 on some of the very first knowledge bases. The first knowledge bases. To gain an idea of where some of the first knowledge bases might have been, we have to travel way back in time, to the beginning of history, basically. Namely, to the year 0 HE, short for Holocene or Human Era. That's about 12,000 years before our time, called the 2020s, reminiscent of some charismatic man's birthday. If you like a notable event to kick things off historically, then take the groundbreaking for the construction of Göbekli Tepe as a starting point. That was a huge temple slash city built in teamwork of probably thousands of folks beginning in 0 HE or around that year, give or take a century or more, who knows for sure, just as Jesus' exact birth date was probably a little off. Anyway, actually what marks the beginning of the Holocene or human era was a major shift in people's living conditions back then. Along with the beginning of settling down. Does sound wildly unspectacular, but it was in modern terms a real game changer. Called Neolithic Revolution for good reason. Humans at that time set the foundation for today's civilization by opting for a less nomadic life and instead planting seeds, growing crops and trading all sorts of things like cattle, grain, slaves I guess, and volcano glass such as obsidian. Due to its popularity as an alternative to flint, obsidian was traded over particularly long distances and was found at many major sites, including Göbekli Tepe. Near Göbekli Tepe, which I probably pronounced wrong, there was discovered the oldest life-size sculpture of a man, with eyes made of obsidian, as just one of many examples for the usage of this raw material. But more often, obsidian was used to make sharp objects, like blades. This, however, required lots of guidance and practice to be done. And that is just what we are looking for. There are archaeological sites where strikingly large numbers of obsidian artifacts were found, worked on in various degrees of skill, from novice to veteran, plus many production errors. These remains suggest that a lot of know-how was present and was passed on in such places. Thus it seems fitting to think of them as some of the first knowledge bases. The takeaway is that it deepens our understanding of what a knowledge base really is about. The Obsidian Revelation A knowledge base is not just a repository where information is gathered and organized. It is primarily a place of education, where teaching and learning happens and where mistakes are made on a path of progress. A knowledge base is a place where knowledge is not only generated, but also applied and shared. In case of a personal knowledge base, it's you sharing its contents with your future self, assisting and educating yourself. But in order to build such a thing, it helps a lot to share experiences within a community along the way. And to make a living with creative work in the digital space, sharing is essential even, in a good way. 
To conclude, here is an exciting insight that can be drawn from all this on the important role that Obsidian played in the process in which the exchange of knowledge and experience and the introduction of new technologies were of governing importance. As a chipped stone tool, Obsidian has had a utilitarian purpose, but it also served as a metaphor of time and value brought by Neolithization. It is then highly probable that the Neolithic communities accepted or rejected the use of Obsidian depending on the preference of their ideological basis towards adjustment to the coming or preservation of the existing time. Preservation of the existing time or adjustment to the coming one. This clash of ideas or mindsets has persisted ever since. Fast forward from Neolithization to the digital age. Your own knowledge base. These days what a knowledge base is made of are not stones, but notes. And of course there's a fancy name for a mindful approach to note-taking in order to build and maintain your own knowledge base. It's called Personal Knowledge Management, in short PKM. I first came in touch with PKM in my early teen years. Did I say PKM again? I meant Pokemon. You know, that open world game and manga series where on Route 42 a mother yells at her daughter, Crystal, to return to the place where she started her training to become a Capture Pro. That's pretty much what you want to become when getting started with PKM, as in personal knowledge management, a Capture Pro. What we try to capture in our knowledge bases are not monsters, but no less mysterious phenomena. We try to capture thoughts. What kind of thoughts? We have thoughts on things, in terms of all possible entities. Thoughts on people, as special entities because they have thoughts of their own, mediated through things we therefore call media. And then of course there are new combinations of thoughts that emerge from creative work. That might lead you to think of categories, like things, people, media, work. Maybe even of folders to sort these, but hold on. What you are doing when you try to put the entirety of everything there is in categories, that is called top-down thinking, and especially in the early stages, that tends to get you stuck. When setting up your own knowledge base, don't start with abstract things like the nature of thoughts in general, but with something as concrete as notes. Notes are like pokeballs, if you will, in notes, thoughts can be captured, written down and edited, refined, sharpened. All it takes is a clear head and some tools. Finding the right tools. 40 years ago, people would have picked up pen and paper and got on with it, just as they did tens of centuries before, but not anymore. Today, finding the right tools for note-taking slash PKM is a digital endeavor, of course, and it can turn into an odyssey and even an end in itself. Beware of that. In the digital era, for an activity as basic as taking notes, you can choose from a vast selection of software. In the past few years alone, a whole new generation of digital note-taking tools emerged, with names such as Rome and Tana. And like back in the new Stone Age, in this new Notes Age, it's a matter of mindset. Do we want to preserve the existing time with tools that have been around for a while, like Evernote or OneNote? Or do we want to always keep up with the coming time and the coming time and the coming time and try new tools as they appear? As so often, the middle way seems like a wise choice. Aristotle would approve. And not every note-taking app is great for building a knowledge base. Because note-taking in this context is not just about quickly capturing and storing notes. The main thing is to be able to link these notes in a meaningful way and to hone them and to make use of them. Only then will a simple set of information become a part of your knowledge. No tool for any and all. Truth is also that there is no one best app for both note-taking and PKM let alone one app for all kinds of users. There are many good apps, old and new, and you have to find one that fits to you, duh! But in this process, such seemingly trivial factors like your habits and taste 
play just as important a role as any hard facts. Ultimately, you'll have to find a few apps for different activities of PKM anyway, like making highlights in books and browser, quick capturing or storing extra sensitive data. Whether all this belongs to PKM as such is for others to discuss. Now, that being said, settling for one app as home for your knowledge base is still really helpful for some peace of mind and to get to the actual work. What I recommend paying special attention to by choosing an app in fast moving times like these, choose an app that lets you access your data even when the app were gone. Essentially that means keeping control over the files that your knowledge base is made of. Don't let them be locked away someplace that you can't access. Personally, I chose an app that combines old and new, as I said, the middle way. It is relatively young, born in 2020, with some state-of-the-art shiny new features, but it stores my notes in a text file format that exists for almost 20 years and will probably outlive me, I don't know. Besides, text itself is a very established, future-proof format. This app is named after a certain volcanic glass that I've mentioned once or twice. It's Obsidian. Now, this piece is meant to be a bit hands-on as well. It's a how-to video after all. So in the following chapter, I will show how to set up a knowledge base using the app of my choice, Obsidian, as an example. If you prefer another tool, cool, 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 no reason to leave just yet, the basics and best practices explained later can be applied to other applications as well. In the description below, you will find a table of contents that should make navigation easier, so feel free to skip around. One place for all notes. The Knowledge Base app Obsidian is available for most platforms and it's free for personal use. So if you want to try it out, grab your favorite device, go online and download the app via obsidian.md. After installation, when you open Obsidian for the first time, you'll see a simple startup window. Here you can set your language if you want and you can create a new vault. What is a vault? Well, ideally I want to have one place for all my notes and writings. In reality, sure, some note taking and writing will always happen elsewhere, but as mentioned, I want to have one place as home for my knowledge base. With Obsidian, this place is a folder on my hard drive, kept in sync between all devices, desktop, laptop, mobile. So actually it's three places, but you get the gist. This folder is called a vault to emphasize the value of its contents. These contents are just loads of text files plus attachments, but to me, they are my everything. Back to the startup window where we can create such a vault. Just click create and give it a nice name. Here are some examples for inspiration. You can rename your vault at any time, so don't dwell too long on the naming. The same goes for the location. You can create your vault where you want and move it later. However, if you want to sync your obsidian files between multiple devices, the location of your vault does matter. More about this in my previous video about syncing obsidian for free. Et voilà, if you followed along, you've just created your own vault as home for your everything. Now you can start taking notes and that's where it gets tricky. Because aside from existing notes, many people struggle with deciding on what should go into their knowledge base in the first place. What is your everything? Story time. Be aware of your everything. As a child of eight or nine years maybe, I once tried to capture all the knowledge of the world. To do this, I took eight sheets of paper, folded them in half and tacked the fold together with a stapler. Thus a book was born, volume one of who knows how many more to come. On the cover I wrote the lexicon on everything in German. I remember an anxiety lurking within me for how should I begin? Next to the title, I drew a blue carafe and a stag beetle. At that time, I thought I knew a lot about animals. On page one, the book says, we'll start with a story. And that's as far as I got. All the other pages are empty. I still told the story though, in pictures. They show a child who climbs a hill. It throws away the rope when reaching the top, 
Up there, wandering in a forest, this child is suddenly surprised by the rain. It runs back, but realizes that it has thrown away the rope. There kneels the child on the hillside and doesn't know where to go. It is stuck between a lost past and an uncertain future. Maybe my child self wanted to draw a metaphor about how we lose ourselves in the pursuit of obscure goats. After all, it's impossible to capture or grasp or know everything. So the question arose, what is worth taking note of to me? The issue at stake here is arguably the most important of all, having interests. That which is between Latin interest, the things and people and wonders of this world, and yourself. An invisible force that pulls at your most precious resource, your attention. Do I still have it? Then I allow myself to direct your attention to the like and share buttons down there. For obvious reasons. Without interests, there's nothing there to poke or stimulate our thinking. Those who have no interests might fall prey to thoughtlessness. A dark abyss from which evil can climb. For more on this, read the greatest philosopher of the 20th century, Hannah Arendt. But of course, the opposite is just as troublesome. Having too many interests, a lack of focus. Thanks to the internet, your mind is exposed to a sphere where your attention is virtually drawn to everything and anything all of the time. And as for the childish idea of an encyclopedia of everything, well, even Wikipedia doesn't dare to make this claim. I think. So when building your own knowledge base, don't try to capture everything there is. Don't recreate the web. It's tricky enough to capture your everything. That is, everything out there that's relevant to you, that resonates with you. In other words, that sparks your interests. You would hardly have ended up here if you didn't already know what your interests are, at least some of them. But still, since interests are always in motion, here are a few tips on how to keep track of them and how to maintain a certain focus on your creative journey. Keep track of your interests. First, make note-taking a daily habit. A nice way to do this in Obsidian is to enable daily notes. That is a core plugin that you will find in the settings and then create a hotkey so you can easily jump to your current daily note. That's the place for quick capturing ideas and findings for journal entries and protocols of what is going on. My first daily notes date back about 15 years. Since then I have not maintained note taking as a daily habit, unfortunately. But it's enough to notice if one does this long enough, capturing thoughts on a semi-daily basis, certain patterns emerge recurring themes and issues that your thoughts evolve around. That's neither wildly surprising, nor do you have to have collected 15 years of notes already to take the next step. It's just a great habit to keep track of how things and thoughts are unfolding over time. Metaphorically speaking, keeping daily notes is like holding onto a thread to where you came from. Or like that rope that you don't want to throw away. On that note, also make it a habit to always note where you come from, thought-wise. This means nothing more than recording the sources of your thoughts, or maybe linking to a previous note that preceded in your train of thought. This leads to an obvious subsequent question, where is the thought train going? The train of thought. Where is this train going? You know. That's what the last part of this piece is about, therefore take some time to step back from everyday life. Finding your life cues. Be it that you look for patterns in your collection of daily notes with some distance, or be it that you browse your thoughts and memories without any notes at hand. Either way, it's usually not that hard to find this one thing you for sure got at least some of. I'm talking about problems. But change of perspective. Every problem can be framed as a question. Some questions follow us through life. By becoming aware of these big cues, we get cues for what we want to be or do in our lives, and thus where our interests lie or come from. Just as the cues in billiards, these big cues set things in motion. They nudge our thoughts, so to speak. 
Here's a list of my current life cues as an example. What do I want? What do I believe? What do I value? How to be free? How to be true? How to be just? Who do I want to be or become? To such broad questions, uh, there are no final answers. They are lifetime questions that we always find new answers to. And more importantly, follow-up questions, which are nothing but projects that we then can get our hands on or heads around. That's what they have in common with philosophical thoughts and with art, I guess. Midway upon the journey of our life, I found myself within the forest, dark, for the straightforward pathway had been lost. To not get lost in a forest dark, a few deliberately chosen questions and projects to work on give some direction to us as we set out into an uncertain future, which is a difficult mission to all of us, because back in school we had history lessons, sure, but how many schools offer future lessons? In practical terms, this means not only noting where your captured thoughts and ideas and quotes come from, but also what questions or projects they can be linked to, what goals or insights you are pursuing with them. If you can't think of any, they are probably not worth keeping after all. This approach helps you to filter what out of the flood of everyday information that sloshes into your daily notes or any other fleeting notes deserves a permanent place in your knowledge base. Depending on how systematically you do this, you might end up with a Zettelkasten. For more on this, read How to Take Smart Notes by Sönke Arends, a short book that's honestly less about the how-to than the why to take notes, but it's still a most helpful read. For the how, there's anyway no better place than internet communities, such as the Obsidian Members Group on Discord, for example. It's linked below. Conclusion This lesson tried to provide some help in setting up your own personal knowledge base. I covered what a knowledge base is all about at its core, namely education, what tool can be used for it in digital times, Obsidian for example, where to put the everyday mess of information and thoughts, your daily notes, and how to find a focus and filter for your everything, by figuring out some life cues of yours. Note that personal knowledge management requires a set of skills that, like any, need regular practice to thrive. So whatever your other interests are, PKM seems to be one of them. Don't treat it as a side thing. Try to master this skill set, for it really broadens your mind and your imagination of what is possible. <laughs> Bit dramatic towards the end. If you enjoyed this piece, feel free to like and share it. For feedback and questions, use the comment section below. Here are some more videos uh, that you might want to check out. Thank you for your attention and auf Wiedersehen. See you soon.